evening. Uh, this is the Fort River Building School Building Committee. This is our meeting on September the 26th, um, and we are in the police uh, station uh, community room, and this meeting is being taped by Amherst Media. Our first agenda item is, well, I just did a call to order, uh, to approve minutes from the previous meeting. Did I send them around? You okay, did. good. I, said, I just sent you back one wee typo. Okay, and I made that typo yeah. change. Okay, great. We have a motion to uh, accept the minutes, or are there other alterations? Actually, I should probably ask first. What do you need to see? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, next is our public uh, comment period, and I don't think we have anyone to make comments. And so we can move to the next item, which is a meeting minute recorder. We do have a new meeting minute recorder, who I think I passed as I was coming in. <laughs> um, and when she gets back, we'll do an introduction. Um, and so we'll move on to uh, reviewing progress. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we did uh, distribute some additional material for you this evening. I see you have it before you. That's good. Uh, I did prepare just a brief agenda of items that we wanted to talk about. Jonathan, I see that you've already included them on yours. But, um, I know we have distributed material to you in the past in loose form. Our intention is to compile all of this event information and create a report for you. Uh, but we thought we would distribute it as, as we produce it. Um, not in front of you are the um, reviews of existing condition in the building. We've had structural engineer visit the building. We've had mechanical engineers. We've had site engineers as well as architects come to the building. And I believe we forwarded three of those disciplines. Uh, I know that architectural still is lagging behind, but we will get those to you as we as we finish them. Um, we thought we would deliver material as it's being developed, and then later compile it. Um, and then we'll edit it as we go forward as well. Now, since the last time we met, we uh, have gone to visit Crocker Farm, as well as Wildwood, we promised that we would. People kept saying, you have to go visit Crocker Farm. Crocker Farm is a great school, you got to go see it. So we did. And it is a great school. It's got a lot of positive features about it. Uh, and I would like to share some thoughts about that uh, this evening. Also, since the last time we met, we've had a meeting um, at Fort River with special ed uh, folks. and. The reason for that is because we wanted a greater understanding of what kinds of activities occur in the spaces that were labeled in the plans that we have received from the school. So we did do that. We also had a, a good meeting with the librarian at Fort River. And then subsequently, on the 20th, we had a meeting with several librarians, um, one from each of the elementary schools. So we would like to share that with you as well. Jesse has updated the program and square footage analysis, now including also Crocker Farm, so that we can compare schools, because that will become a subject of discussion, I'm sure, in public meetings. And then this evening, we would like to share some initial concepts, uh, some layouts, if you will, programmatic layouts uh, that are done to scale, uh, but they're not, they're not architectural plans <coughs> yet. They are scale drawings so that it's an allocation of program. Uh, and so we'll walk you through that. First, some observations of Crocker Farm. So I did distribute to everyone uh, this print printout of several snapshots that we took. Um, Crocker Farm has a gymnasium just like Fort River and Wildwood do. Of all of them, it appears to us that Crocker Farm is the smallest of them all. Um, and it seems to be adequate for the activities that were occurring there. You have one gym teacher, 
if you were to go to a second gym teacher, then maybe it would be inadequate. Maybe you'd have to divide it into two teaching stations. Um, it has a wood floor. And there was all this activity in the room when we visited it. Um, one of the nice things of Crocker Farm is the courtyard arrangements that are within the footprint of the school. It brings a lot of natural daylight into the interior of the building. Unlike the courtyards that are at Fort River or Wildwood, which are way too small, and um, part of them are blocked up and you can't really get the daylight into the interior space like you can at Crocker Farm. So we really like that architectural feature of Crocker Farm. The library at Crocker Farm is smaller than the other schools. However, it's described as a favorite place in the school. Everybody seems to love that library. And there's different zones in the library that function very well with different kinds of seating, comfortable seating, as well as study tables, as you can see in photos five and six. Uh, there are computer stations in the library, so the library is uh, intelligently divided into different zones so that you can have multiple grades, multiple classes in the room, um, all doing activities at the same time. Uh, the cafeteria is pleasant space. It has clear story windows, round tables, storage on both sides of the room, and uh, the corridors have very nice cubbies, well proportioned. Photo 10 is, is a courtyard with the resilient surface. There, there seems to be three different themes of courtyards. Uh, there's a soft courtyard, there's a contemplative courtyard, and then there's this active courtyard with the resilient surface. Uh, and this, this one happens to be closest to the sixth grade. And preschool. Preschool uses this one. Yeah, preschool. And the preschool. Thank you. Uh, and the pre-K pre or pre-K classroom, which are on photo 11, they have direct access to the play areas outside. It's a very nice arrangement. Uh, and then there are these coat cubby alcoves within classrooms, as you can see it on photo 12. We have seen that occasionally in schools not be successful. I'm not sure if there's been any problem in, these, in this kind of configuration. Sometimes there's a real log jam of activity in these spaces. And sometimes people have been critical of activities being unseen uh, because it's sort of a blind corner. But I, I don't know if that's a positive or negative experience at Parker Park. Yeah, most of, the, most of the cubbies in classrooms are not in this configuration. This is just in that addition that was put on. Yeah, just the pre K zone, yeah. And sixth grade. And sixth grade. Oh, the sixth grade too. Sixth grade, the, the second story had, that's, I think what that is. The others are just a, a, a wall. Classroom. So we, at the end of the tour, we understood why everyone said you had to go to the Parker Farm. There are some very good aspects to it. Um, Might be worth mentioning. Uh, sure. Let me interrupt. Go ahead. Um, that the population at Crocker Farm is 420 students. Just kind of right in our range. So it's also yeah, that's one of our target enrollments that we're looking at. So there's a. It's helpful to look at that school for that reason as well, in terms of its overall square footage, which you'll see we've added to our um, square footage tracking sheet. Um, it's also a three sections per grade school, which is basically what 420 results in. So. Right. Um, so one of the differences between Wildwood and uh, Fort River is the number of special ed rooms. Am I interpreting them correctly? I mean, you've kept tally of that. There's a fair number of spaces that are labeled special ed in Fort River, and these spaces are quite large. And I think I made the comment once before that we have a phenomenon in which we have existing building, existing footprint, and so by default, the rooms are larger. Uh, so it, it's, it's not the kind of room that you would necessarily plan if you were planning a new building and having maybe only six people or eight people in a room, you would normally plan a room that's smaller than that. Um, however, at Fort River, you have these large spaces. There are also a few differences between the special ed rooms between Fort River and Wildwood. Can you help describe what that 
those differences are? Well, I think you see it um, due to Wildwood student population being higher, you're really running three sections per grade again, similar to Crocker Farm. And so in their quad, which has four classrooms in a quad, they can only allocate one of those rooms to special ed. Um, and so that, in Fort River, you often have two of the four rooms allocated to special ed. So I think that's where you see that additional space in Fort River because it's available, as it's because the student population is less right now. <coughs> I did also want to share with you something that I discovered on my shelf in the office, which is this publication. Um, this publication is one of many publications that was published by the Education Facility Laboratory, which is a nonprofit organization that was funded by the Ford Foundation. And I think they started in like the 50s, 1958 or so. But, and I, I can't find the date of this publication, but I think it was around 1965. Some of the plans that are in this booklet uh, date to schools that were built in 1965. So I, this evening I distributed to you some excerpts from that, which is in this handout. Um, why am I bringing this up? Because, well, I find it interesting <laughs> to see how schools have changed over the years. And why do they change, I kind of wonder. So, you see in photo one, you see this open classroom at Fairmont Elementary School in California. And then there's another example of an open classroom in another school in California. And then in photo three, you'll see a diagram <coughs> uh, a school for, in Utah and that has these quad classroom configurations. Each of these classroom areas is to house four classrooms. So that was a concept that was being talked about at that time. I'll get to that in a minute. But I was also intrigued by this teacher workstation uh, in this school in Ohio, as you can see. And it has these plywood fold-down desks, built-in desks with these scissors uh, hinges. And then, son of a gun, you have the same, exactly the same thing at Fort River School. It's like the detail was copied out of this book. So what, was, what were we thinking at that time? What was Educational Facilities Laboratory, which was proposing new and innovative school planning, not only at the public school level, elementary level, but also at college and university level. What were they thinking? Well, if you look at the board of directors, in this uh, body of people. It included uh, the chairman of the board from the Lever Brothers Company. It had the chairman of the board from uh, IBM. It had uh, Ford Foundation. It had uh, people from universities, superintendent of schools in Chicago, uh, an organization in Detroit. So what was going on at that time? Well. I, you know, Detroit was pumping out automobiles. Uh, IBM was uh, occupying huge open floors. Open offices were the thing. Uh, if you looked at headquarters in, in, in office headquarters, you'd see that kind of planning. And so, it may be that that kind of thinking leaked down into the educational sector, thinking that okay, you know what? Let's make open classrooms, flexible space will change departments, will reconfigure very easily. And I think that's sometimes what happens. This is my opinion, um, that people think of uh, schools as workplaces. So if you look at schools way back, you know, when, when people were being educated to enter the workforce and the assembly line, so you had a lot of bells and cells kind of configuration of space. And this was the era of the open classroom. It didn't work. It didn't work, and people were now changing things. But if we were to think about um, how people work today, maybe there's something that we can learn from workspace today. If you look at how offices are being planned, right? Workspaces are being planned right now. You have places like Google, right? So where all kinds of activities occur, where food is present. 
it's, it's a much richer kind of environment. So anyway, I just wanted to share this with you because when I discovered this, I thought, well, this is an interesting piece of history. And it might, in public discussions about the existing school, be interesting to the public about where we were and where we may be going in the future. So um, let's talk about libraries because we did meet with librarians and we did observe that the library at the Fort River School is large. And I think we reported that last time that it was large compared to the MSBA guidelines. Um, and it's larger than the Crocker Farm. And its collection is quite large too. According to the librarian, there are 34,000 volumes in Fort River Library. In my experience, that's a lot. We're just finishing up a library, a uh, school construction right now that has a school library in it. And it's for a population of 374. Thank you. 374. And it has only 13,000 volumes in it. And the square footage of that is very close to the MSBA guidelines. It's not a Massachusetts school. Nevertheless, it, it falls within the, the, the state guidelines. And uh, what I did is distribute to you some floor plans to show you the kinds of activities that are planned for that library. So we have large group rooms. We have maker spaces, technology areas, computers, quiet study areas, adult seating. And there are variations of that layout in, on every page you see variations. All of the uh, furniture in this library is on casters so that the furniture can be moved around very easily. Also, the shelving Except for the shelving along the walls. All the shelving in the open floor area is also on casters. So it's very easy for staff in this future library that will be open in, a, in just a few months to reconfigure it and create a place of assembly, for example. That was one of the things that the school librarians pointed out to us, that they needed to have a space for places of assembly. They might have a guest speaker, for example, an author, uh, an evening meeting. That's all taken into account in the planning of this new library. It's a school library, and that could be easily achieved simply by moving the furniture around. I'm bringing that up because square footage is directly related to cost. And this committee is going to have to make some difficult decisions about square footage and cost. Um, and this is probably a good time to talk about square footage and give you an update on the program and square footage chart that Jesse has distributed. Okay. Um, so you have the chart, I assume. Um, so since we last met, um, we've refined the chart relative to a couple of areas. The first, we've added Crocker Farm existing conditions uh, adjacent to the Fort River column. Uh, those are the first two columns on the, on the left side after the room type column. Um, and it seemed helpful to add Crocker, Crocker Farm because um, it, it doesn't have the challenges of the open classroom uh, in terms of defining room areas, for example. Um, and, and it's an example of a school which you're telling us is, is something that works well for the student population of 420. Um, so now we have both we can compare our proposed room areas against. Um, the second thing we updated on the spreadsheet is the special education uh, rooms, which I think we should come back to and jump ahead to the media center because Richard's uh, speaking about it now. Um, as you can see, the media center we've proposed is the same one that the MSBA guideline um, recommends. And it's actually slightly larger than the media center at Crocker Farm. Um, and and we're, we're recommending this size media center because of our experience in 
building media centers, um, such as the one that we put in front of you, that we can achieve a variety of the zones for learning, um, create a, a learning commons, a lot of different learning opportunities, and also uh, have a collection of a reasonable size. I think where we're asking this committee's opinion is with regard to the, the larger collection that you currently have. Um, we, I did ask the question how, how the collection is acquired. I asked if there was a, a district-wide media specialist or a library specialist, and I was told no. And I was told that uh, each librarian decides what they need to purchase. Um, and perhaps there's some duplication in the purchases. I haven't gone through the collection specifically, but I think I think that needs to be visited again. But, yes? Um, so you met with librarians this week. Did you talk about this question about the collections and what the philosophy is behind it in Amherst? Um, we did ask the question. and We were told that the collection is based upon the faculty needs, that the, that the faculty goes to the library and needs that collection of books. Um, we asked the question if there was duplication. We were told no, there really isn't a duplication. But I'm, I'm raising the question to this committee. Uh, I asked the librarian if she could provide some resource material to uh, explain that in more detail. I asked, she asked if she could bring in some library standards, and I said, by all means, you should, uh, to help this committee understand the reasons for the size of that collection. As another point of comparison, how many volumes does Wildwood's library contain? 28,000. So Fort River and Wildwood are very close, and the outlier is, is Rockefeller. We don't have that information collection is at the Rocket Farm. I thought you said 13 k yeah, That was for different No, 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 no. Oh, that's yeah. a different oh, principle. Oh. That's but just based on a visual, it's going to be significantly less. Yeah, I mean, the Wildwood and Fort River have just a ton of space, and they have stacks of books that go up higher than the librarian prefers. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, we're being asked to make lower stacks um, and to make um, assembly space, mm -hmm. which we can do with flexible furnishings, but um, and at the same time, if you preserve the collection count, you'd actually need more space, as they're concerned, than what you currently have. So I'm not sure that the librarian feels that they have the authority to say they can reduce the collection. Um, it's a concern I have about asking the librarian. It's a big interesting question. So I was also um, at the library meeting, and I asked two questions. One was about duplication, because even just sitting there and speaking, um, uh, at that time, I was noticing the shelves, and there were quite a few duplicate titles. This is internal duplicates, so we'll have two. Yeah. You know, it's the, the exact same book, multiple book. copies of the okay. same book. This we were at, we were sitting <coughs> at the Wildwood Library, okay. by the way, at, yes. at, at this point. So I, sure. I wasn't at the Fort River Library, yeah. but um, and I asked, you know, what is the degree of duplication and you know, is is that a standard that you know needs to be met to have some duplication, or can you live without duplication? Um, the other question I asked was, of the titles that you have, what is the actual use, and how many of those titles have not been checked out, have not been used in the past? You know, pick some time frame, ten years or something like that, to know. Well, we got 34,000, but we're really using 20,000. Right. So they didn't have that information at the time, but I think that's really critical yeah. um, to find out. I, I, I agree. I, I know Lainey worked really hard over the summer, actually, to cull a lot of the collection. She did, she yes. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, well, I'm just reading the newsletter we got. Um, and just for reference, it says, in the first week of school, Fort River students checked out over 850 books. In the Fort River thing. So if they're checking out different books, that's close to a thousand titles in a week. And if there's how many weeks in a, in a school year? And if it's a different look. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, two books per child if the population is 420. Yeah. So, I mean, there's 
mean, just based on those numbers, it doesn't sound unreasonable for a collection that large, but I totally agree. It's maybe there's other ways to go about circulating those books into those spa that space. And so as someone who's working on the library renovation at a different type of school, yes. um, this conversation could go on for hours <laughs> and hours. I think it's a lot of input. <laughs> and yes. I don't think it's anything we're going to solve today. We could go down a rabbit hole of talking about it. We wouldn't really get anywhere. But I think it's a really important question. And so I'm not really sure from this committee said, you know, like what our role would be right. or not in exploring that question. I, th I think one way for us as a group to frame it is that at the, schema at the study level that we're at, we want to be able to give our designers a direction um, based on upon our collective best judgment. Um, knowing that, in this particular topic, it sounds like there should be really a district-wide conversation um, about what the appropriate, if there hasn't been, that, that and there's all there has or hasn't been, right, the there's all kinds of ways to do that. And, right. yeah. Um, but we can't, as a committee, necessarily wait for that to transpire um, because I think it sounds like it's something they could spend quite some months figuring out. Yeah, I think what Maria was asking about, sorry, <laughs> about which, what's the percentage of books being checked out, I think that's the number that we need that it's going to tell us more or less. Um, because. They can check out 850 books, but how many of those are going to be checked out next week because those are in high demand or the popular right. collections are maybe there's a subset of, of, it, of the 34,000, maybe there are 3,000 that are checked out constantly out and then a day off throughout the year. So we need to, I think we need the, the number. Well, we certainly can put that question to the staff. Right. Um, whether they can give us that answer in the, sh in the short term, I don't know. Um, but maybe we, we may at some point relatively soon here have to make a call about, okay, we know this conversation isn't done, um, but for the purposes of this exercise, we want you to use this size. For Fair the, enough. The uh, about a month from now, we would like to start turn, turning over information to cost estimators. Right. And square footage is one of the first things that has to be pinned down right. for cost estimating purposes. So, you know, the, the strategy for um, storing books uh, can take different forms. Okay. It could be perhaps distributed throughout the building. I mean, we've seen that too, where the collection of books is in shelving in classrooms. I see someone shaking their head. No, but it's a, stra it's a strategy that some facilities can take. It still takes space. It still yes. takes space. If I could just extrapolate then on the 13,000, sure. because I kind of hooked onto that early on. That was a school that met the MSBA recommendations for a population of our size of what we're looking at. So is it fair to say that that 13K is the target that would fit in the floor plan that you showed us based on what you would recommend for the population of Fort River? Yes. So we're talking about reducing by 50% the collection. More than 50%. More than, more than 50%. Well, You're going from 34 to 13. Another way to frame it, I think I would like, if we can, divine that, that how much of this collection is really used, if we can. Yeah, and, and I think it's critical that we get the Crocker Farm number. I'm, yeah. I'm sure we can acquire that number. Because part of this is about being comparable. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, at 420, Crocker Farm is a very interesting comparable. Um, and if we don't have other ways to, to kind of come to a place to direct you, that might be a place, you know, even if they have more than the MSBA, I can imagine a, for parity purposes, case for saying, well, let's work to what works at Crocker. Yeah. Well, I think the square footage on Crocker is actually 5% less than what you're recommending. Yes. Right? yes. So it's actually smaller. It's actually yeah. smaller. And if Crocker Farm works. It may not be a bad model. It may not be a bad model. I don't expect a decision tonight, but as I say, in about a month's time, about four weeks from now, we'd like to start releasing information to cost us. Okay. Oh. So do we need to define a process to collect this information? I think if we could ask you to follow up with the librarian at Crocker Farm, um, and 
I suspect at Wildwood and Fort River to see if they can give us some notions about how much of that collection really is actively used. I mean, I, I don't want them to feel like we're, we're telling them they're going to have to cut their collection because that's not our place, um, but it's, I think, an interesting metric we would, we would want to know. Eric? Yeah, I think one of the challenges we have is that um, we haven't always had, we, I guess we haven't had the superintendent here a lot. Yes. We haven't had the principal here all the time either, and we don't have any of our teachers. Um, even though I know I have staff present, which is nice. Uh, and um, we, I don't, I mean, we need to, we need to flag this That's for something. the principal. And, mm -hmm. Because yep. we can't, we can't butcher the current space okay. and basically <laughs> radically change the program for the media collection. Uh, and just sort of present that to them as a well, play. Right. And I wanted quite to right. add that even, right. even asking the questions, we could, I don't know what it would be like here, but we could yeah. be stepping into a, a huge controversial, you know, it could like you oh, just ask the yeah. questions, yeah. start getting things like, oh my God, they want to start getting rid of the books. Right. I mean, exactly. It, exactly. it could go from finding out, you know, what the situation is to yeah. that. I, and I, I, I feel, just think it could be. I feel we owe you information. Right, and and so some of this is a difficult conversation, but I think that's the nature of this study. We, we did share this with the superintendent prior to the meeting, and we had a favorable response in general. Now, with regard to this specific detail, I think you may need to flag yeah, we, the we issue. Flag that that is something, yeah. okay, yeah. we're... we're, we're I, I also just don't... I'd be... I'd be fascinated to know if that favorable response was actually thinking through the implications of, let's say, publicly presenting in January right. yep. that we're having the space for our, our media right. center. Right. Mm -hmm. um, my guess, you know, my guess is the answer is the analysis wasn't that deep <laughs> of what you were showing. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it should be flagged. And, and yeah. We need to yeah. continue talking about. I mean, it's the same thing, honestly, with the special education space too. But it also gets back to other things that you know. There's certain things that the district does differently than the MSBA mm -hmm. would say is the standard, and it's a choice that Amherst makes for, for perfectly valid reasons. And likewise, we could choose to go a different path. That, that's a very good point, and that's a very good point, and that's why we started this whole uh, assignment that we have from the, from the town to let's start with an ed spec. Let's put in words what your curriculum goals are, what your educational goals are. If you can justify to MSBA that you need a collection on this side and these are the reasons why, that's the position you should take, regardless of what the MSBA guidelines are. But we will have done a good deal of due diligence and understand what that guideline was. Right. So, um, yes to everything, but what we also have to remember is that as you said, every bit of square footage is additional cost. There is not an endless pot to, to choose from. Um, every every you know, additional square foot also you know, has environmental impacts, no, yes. no larger buildings. So there, there are costs of many forms to square footage, and we are going to have to, um, the point of this is not to present something that is yeah. not feasible, that cannot pass all kinds of other muster. So the, the hard truth is there is not going to be a 4,700 square foot library media space that exists now, right? That's just not going to be possible. We need that square footage for other things as well. So I think we have to start thinking in, in those terms. and big picture, because everybody's going to want to protect their turf. So I mean, have you done campus work in the past? Have you been involved in campus, <laughs> campus facility <laughs> planning? <laughs> <laughs> This is what happens on, no in campus, in yeah. campus uh, facility planning, where you have department heads yeah. and uh, yeah. square footage is pushed and pulled. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. I don't want to, I think you have an order of things that you want to talk about, but the other thing that jumped out to me is when you said that the um, gymnasium at Crocker Farm appeared to be smaller, according to your square footage, it's 25% smaller, and I think that's a notable difference. 
Thank you. I, I was doing this from memory, and you know, this Jess, yeah. Jesse's done a great job in actually accurately um, tracking things. So you're right; it's quite a bit small. Right. Whereas the to continue on that thought, the MSBA guideline for the gymnasium would be twice the size of Crocker Farms Gymnasium. It's quite a bit bigger, right. and, um, and a good bit bigger than what Fort River has. Right. Yes. Yes. So when, when we discussed this issue. The previous meeting, we were asked to proceed with the larger gymnasium, and so we have in our initial studies. But I think that's something that may require more discussion as well, it may need to be flagged. So let, let me ask that question then. So if we decide to recommend a smaller gymnasium, because that's what seems to be working already in all three elementary schools, would MSBA have a problem with that? And I think not. Yeah, I, I'm, I think in keeping the existing gym uh, in a renovation scenario, no, no problem. I wonder about building a new gym that's uh, smaller than their standards, if they would fund that. The reality is their, their gym size is based on a regulation basketball court. Right. And the reality is, at least for the school purposes, that's not necessary. Now, you know, there's an enormous demand on town gyms park and rec and all kinds of activities. So there may be a desire to add to your inventory of full-size basketball courts, but it's probably not going to be driven by the educational needs of the school. I'm not sure who had their hand up first. Um, yeah, I was just going to point out, I don't believe Crocker Farm runs any weekend basketball programming, whereas Fort River and Wildwood do. I'm not 100% sure about that, but that's my impression of what I've heard just by reading the parks and rec thing. Um, and it does seem that what I've heard from parents is that it does not function for that purpose right. well at all. And so it does seem a need in the town that using Crocker Farms comparison is kind of a tough one in this case because it's it's not serving the same purpose. Right. So right, in the spreadsheet it's the segment that has the widest discrepancies between the two school the two schools and the one school and then the recommendation. So aside from being uh, based on a full size basketball court, um, does the MSBA assume any other secondary use like assembly that would happen in the gymnasium as opposed to a media center, which is sort of an art or cafeteria. Or cafeteria. Yes. Yes, they do. And they like uh, a stage or a platform to be part of that configuration so that it can be used as a place of assembly with a presentation before the assembly. We'd be encouraged to zone those public access spaces in a way that the public can enter them without getting Separate. into the academic part of the building. Right? Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. So I, I think it would be fair to say that going anything smaller than the current Fort River and Wildwood would, would uh, you know, try intentionally putting in something the size of Crocker Farms gym would make no sense. I mean, you have to be at least as big as what is already there. Um, while we're talking about the multi-purpose use of a gymnasium, I think we should talk about is a gymnasium or a cafeteria better suited to that function. Um, um, I can speak for how um, it works at Crocker Farm. I can't speak to how it works in other places, but having it be a cafeteria auditorium um, I believe it has less impact on um, programming, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Shea would be the person that I'd ask about that. Um, so if, if the MSBA wouldn't ding us for having something less than 6,000 square feet and we could have something maybe a little bit more so that there is a little bit more space, maybe have bleachers on one side of it, doesn't need bleachers on both sides or something like that, um, maybe we could hit a happy medium there to serve that role of uh, public use, school use, but get the cafeteria in play for a stage. We actually have configured school to have the stage that operates both ways, both sides, to the gym side and to the cafeteria side, or functions as a um, standalone. standalone classroom for music purposes as well. So you see that in, in a new configuration, we can get that to work both ways. One of the nice things about um, having the stage face the cafeteria is the cafeteria is used for a limited period of time. And so if you have different kinds of phys ed activities, if you 
trying to set up a stage that kind of conflicts with the phys ed program. So, um, I mean, Port River definitely is used for recreational basketball. So I think it's I think it's valuable to think about whether the size it is now is actually even adequate. Um, I know I've been down there on a weekend when there were families and basketball going on, and it's it's pretty it's a pretty crowded environment. Um, but also, I think people love Crocker Farm, and they're very attached to it, and they say very positive things about it. I don't know that that's the same thing as saying that all of the spaces are optimally sized in it. Um, it is indeed utopia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's also particularly loved in comparison with Weldon and Fort River. As a facility, yeah, sure. I'm just saying purely as a facility. The communities, people love all three communities. Yes. And so I'm just not, I guess to my mind, it's a little bit like the conversation with the media center, is the sort of position that we seem to be taking, which is a reasonable one, I think, is if we can look at alternative scenarios for media centers that are smaller and they seem to function in the MSBA guidelines say this seems like a standard size um, the, it's not that we're saying we want to just default to that and not listen to alternative scenarios but the point is we're saying let's understand what the justification is for being larger and even if it's never 4300 square feet maybe it ends up being whatever would be larger than this 3,400 because there's actually a rationale for having to pay 3,400. I don't know. But the point would be taking the standard and then seeing why would we be deviating from it. And so I'm just saying the same thing about the gymnasium is I'm not, I'm not sure there's any particular reason to be in love with the size of the gyms we have now. And if, they're, if they can be larger and function in a more diverse way with the community events or recreational events, I don't think that's a bad thing. And it could be smaller, but if it is, we should try to think about what the justification is for being smaller. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't default to the idea that because Crocker <coughs> works, we should just cut cut a thousand square feet off of it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I would say as somebody who coaches basketball in that very gym, the the Fort River gym is not adequately sized. There, there's always overflow onto the court, and it, it actually creates a dangerous situations sometimes. So I, I, right. that needs to be like the minimum I would think. So, I would say, I wouldn't go under what we have right now, but I don't know if we need to go to the full size. If we are doing a renovation, I would like to keep the gym in some form. We don't have to be, oh, we need to add 6,000, have a 6,000 square foot, so we need to be a completely new gym, whereas we have the new, the one there. Maybe there are ways of repurposing some of the space around it to include, give them some more footage to put pictures yes. um, without having to say, oh, it doesn't have this volume that we need, so we need a completely new one in a renovation. If we are going to co complete new building, it's a different thing, but if we are going uh, with renovation or at reno, I will try to see if, how can we use the current footprint of the, of the gym and maybe add some footage, but maybe we don't have to go all the way to the 6,000 because as we were saying, which square foot is money, so we have to right. optimize. Square foot is money. I yeah. couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. Follow up on that because I had the same exact thought that you know it seems to make much more sense um, for a renovation project to keep as much as we can, like it is, because it's certainly a cost savings. But as a feasibility study, um, I'm really concerned about providing information to the community in a digestible form that really compares apples to apples. And if we make heavy compromises for the renovation that we don't make on a new construction, I'm really afraid that people are going to say, oh, look how much less expensive it is to renovate. And they don't realize all the compromises that yes. went in mm -hmm. to that. And so I'd, I'd be really scared about programmatically changing things between the renovation and new construction. I think they need to be fairly comparable. You never get them to be exactly, right. yeah. exactly the same, but I think they need exactly to be a little same. bit of balance. You will never, once you are renovating, you will never be exactly the same as a completely new construction because in the new construction you can define exactly your square footage. When in renovation, you need to adapt to the existing conditions. So to put exactly that people won't understand that you're saying in this situation we have maybe a gym that's 15 or 20% smaller. It's not giving credit to the, the 
whole population. I think we can be clear on what are the main differences. Where, where are some of the cost cutting or savings that comes? It's okay, this has a media center that is 10% larger, this one has a gym that is 10% smaller. I think we can put information like that, but to be tasked ourselves to do a design where the square footage of everything is exactly the same, I think it's shooting us in the foot. Well, I, I do think you need to disclose to the community yeah. where the compromises are. Right. If you're going to be comparing a range of options, which is what we're supposed to yeah. be doing, then we're going to have a minimal approach and we're going to have the ideal approach, and then there are pros and cons to each of them. So I think we need to we need to disclose that information. Yeah, but I just don't want to radically different. You know, I think there's going to be we're going to be making a lot of compromises when it comes to environmental. Um, sort of operational things in the um, renovation, just because that is also the nature of a renovation. You're not going to jackhammer up the entire, well, maybe we need to, that's a separate discussion, the four-inch slab to get some insulation underneath of it. Um, so I, I'm just, I just, I think that's something we need to keep in mind, sure. that we end up with enough of an apples to apples that we right. can, in, in three sentences or less, explain to the community what the comparison is. If we end up with something radically different, I don't think, because people are going to look at the two numbers and that's all they're going to look at. And if we can't explain in very shorthand what the differences are, we're setting ourselves up for not getting. Well, you know, the other thing that will come up is, is then it calls into question one of the two options. If, if there's a radical difference in square footage, so if the small one works, why are we spending all this money on the new one? And if you need the big new one, why are we selling for one that we've already established doesn't work? So you do need to get a certain amount of parity, and yes, there's going to be a certain amount of plus minus, you know, 10% based on, you know, existing conditions. And that's something as a group we're going to have yes. to kind of keep our eyes on. Exactly. To make yeah. sure that we are keeping this equitable between the options. So there were a couple hands that were up. I know. Marie, did you have something? To Same thing. Yeah, that was an echo. Okay, Eric. Yeah, I was just curious, actually, when we when you're working through the report, uh, and I know this is down the road, um, are you going to include some of the analysis or work that's going on right now? Meaning, in other words, here's what we saw as the existing usage pattern in the town. Uh, here's what MSBA would typically suggest. Um, here's the conversation or what we learned around why we would recommend something that's either similar to what's the standard state standard or up or down from it and then we're you know and, and I don't know if you go as far as the plus or not say what you think about the drawbacks or benefits of that but I mean to me I'm, I'm more comfortable with looking at whatever the range is plus or minus 10% of different things mm -hmm. if in the end what people can do when they look at the information at the end is they can understand what are we doing now, um, you know, what what are we proposing to do, how <coughs> it's typically done, and what are the pluses and minuses of it. I don't know if that makes sense in terms of what the. I'm not looking for a book. I know that could be like 3,000 pages. Yeah, but I just, it could be a book, but but you need some executive summary that kind of distills all of that data into common sense language that that the public can yeah. understand and, and what it is that they're buying. We have the data here. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine, you know, there's a, some kind of spreadsheet with the program, the agreed on program, and then the comparables, you know, your other schools, and then a remarks column that explains in any area where we deviate significantly why we deviated. Yeah. And then there's a little paragraph, the committee thought, based on talking to staff, and future use that we wanted to go up or it felt could be smaller. For most of columns, you know, it'll be self-evident, it's close and there'll be no discussion, but for the items where there is deviation and we've had these discussions, there'll be a little, an asterisk, you know, see item remark one and then there's a little commentary on why the committee decided to go to the bigger gym. I, I just think that's really useful because, I mean, this is, a, this is an excellent, I think, moment for this sort of reflect, observation again or reflection again that the product of this committee is going to end up going into some other process that then actually eventually ends up building a building. Right. So really what we're trying, and I know that sounds convoluted, but it's not intended to be. I think what's to so the point being is, 
the more the information we have here is legible, mm -hmm. transparent, somebody can follow what the information is, what it tells you, where the different standards come from, what the implications of different choices are, and then and then see what like the cost and other and other implications, like including environmental or energy efficiency implications come out of that product, then we've moved the, the discussion in this town forward by miles. Correct. And to the extent that we don't do that, obviously, right. and it's more like here's our recommendation, but then people are like, well how'd you come up with that? Exactly. And you don't then, want then it's you know, we so, the study yeah. and say, here, this is how we ended up with that. Right? It doesn't mean there isn't a recommendation. I'm just saying, you know, I don't mean there's no point to it. I'm just saying people can un unpack it and understand They can the unpack it and they can delve into it in greater detail. And as far as environment is concerned, that's another thing that we need to start initiating in about a month or so. We, not, we owe you some energy modeling. And so we will like to start doing some energy modeling of different options that we can Pondering. I think that that is really important. I mean, we've been focused on upfront costs with square footage, but understanding, you know, target EUIs and the energy Correct. modeling and what it costs to run and maintain these buildings with renovation versus new construction is really important. That's correct. You have a figure here that I like to call below the line. That's mm -hmm. below the line, the initial cost. But then what about the next 20 years? Mm -hmm. So we would like to flesh all that out mm -hmm. as part of this report. So with regard to the report, um, we've started to structure our work so far along the guidelines of the MSBA feasibility study report, thinking that if you're accepted to the program, you could potentially use this work as whoever, whoever it is that does that next step. Um, and they do have a requirement that you outline the deviations from their guideline for each place where you make a modification. So in a way, that may be exactly what you asked for. And then we could, in that narrative, um, refer back to the Fort River and Crocker Farm precedents in town so that it works for people in town. So if that sounds all right, but I think it, right. the difference I'm asking is that it, it's based, it's deviations from the MSBA guideline mm -hmm. as the standard in the case that we work with. Okay. Are there any other things you want to point out in the chart before we start discussing the options? Well, I, I went past the special education section okay. because it's complicated, um, but I think we, we should touch on it at least. Um, and so you can see in the first column, I'll just go over the gross areas for special ed. The Fort River, as we mentioned, is sort of spread out in the open space, and it's 12,000 square feet for those, those programs, whereas Crocker Farm is much less, it's 6,400. Now, there are some major differences, of course. Fort River has both the Ames program and the Building Blocks program, which are um, special, edu special special education programs. Um, that's the best I can do with it's it. District-wide. District district yeah. Thank you. That's better. Um, so we've proposed more space, 7,200 square feet, um, to um, account for those programs in the Fort River School. Um, now, as you wonder, how did we get to these breakdowns? Um, with regard to the Ames program and the Building Blocks program, we met with the district-wide special ed um, administrator, I forget her name right now, but she helped us determine the um, room requirements for those programs. And so I think that's fairly accurately represented. Um, and then with regard to the uh, remaining, which is um, your special education, your sort of general special education, your ELL, speech, math, reading, um, all of these specialists who, who actually function in the classroom for a great percentage, but need to pull students out um, for focused instruction. Um, we have allotted spaces for them based on your staff counts at Fort River currently. Um, so, um, and, and giving them spaces that in our experience will allow them to pull students out um, and are more along the lines of the kinds of space you see at Crocker Farm. Um, the difference being at Fort River, the, the pullout space is often a very large space because that's what's available. Um, so I'm generally describing the strategy we took. Um, I don't know if anyone here has the, the fine view that would be able to weigh in on that, but tell me, how do we proceed? Can we proceed along these lines? Oh, this is more of a question than a, yes. than a comment. Was it Jen McIntyre that you? Yes, okay. thank you. Um, I, 
I'm wondering if, if there was a discussion with Jen uh, about, um, you know, we have a line in here for the breakout spaces per grade, and right. um, how that, you know, that's certainly not going to serve the purposes of an Ames or a Building Blocks program. I mean, no. no. But it seems like, I mean, at least in my head, you know, those spaces start to fill a little bit of a, a ELL and a little bit of reading and a little bit of math. And, thank you, but thank you and, for bringing this up. Right. Yeah. We, we noticed the RTI rooms at Crocker Farm, which is the, um, Anyone know? <laughs> it's a uh, post intervention. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so there, response uh, to intervention. Response to intervention. There's two of these rooms, and they're basically multi-use spaces that reading, ELL, math can use to pull students into. They're not. They're not labeled any one person's room, and that seemed to be a very smart use of space. Each one, or they're about 550 square feet each. Each one has about three teaching stations in it, approximately. So you'd say, well, that's six teaching stations for Crocker Farm for the two rooms. And we have, in our program, instead, um, six breakout teaching spaces, which are associated per grade. But each one is smaller, 150 square foot. It's like one teaching station. So I think that's the intent <coughs> of those rooms, is to, yes? Um, I'm just wondering if we, those should maybe be listed as special education, or if they should be, like, I don't know if. You know. Maybe they should. I can move it down to special education. They're, I, mean, I don't know what they're not. actually, they're, they're general education. Yeah, I mean, there's such a crossover. I mean, this whole like categorizing special education separate from general yeah. education is I kind of a know. false dynamic anyway, but, right. um, but I, yeah, so I'd like to hear more. That's why, yeah, I'd like to hear that talked about a little more. And, well, and, currently, and, we have reading, ELL, and math all in the special education category. I guess it could all move up to core academic as well. And I don't think my spreadsheet it matters relative to my spreadsheet. Uh, I guess but what I, I'm, I'm listening. I think the ones on the top are for the classes that are co taught. Right. So they, they, they are co teachers. So, so oh, yes. one the one would, I think, for River, there is one class per grade that is called co teachers. And I think this would be the space. The co teachers usually have a space in the quad also to pull out kids. So I think this is what they're re referring to. For the for the for the co-teachers on the of the grade, so yes. there's one classroom per grade that is with two teachers. Did you guys get a chance to talk to any of the or observe the differences between a co-taught classroom and a private classroom? We observed a co-taught classroom briefly. Yeah. We haven't spent a lot of time. Right, yeah. and, and sort of on the space diagram, like when you look at the existing in Fort River, there's no sort of indication of difference. So basically, the default at Fort River is all the classrooms are the same square footage. Right. Um, but we would start to try to distinguish between co taught classrooms and. Uh, I'm sure it's a square footage difference from what we observed, but we did in our layouts put two classrooms next to each other, thinking those were the co taught classrooms. Well, no, the breakout areas, I think, is the, where, okay. the, yeah. where the additional teacher is. So maybe this not, this breakout space would not be available for ELL or, or math intervention or... Why is there a teacher in the breakout space? Well, it, it would be a special ed teacher. It could be a special ed teacher if, if that's what's scheduled. Yeah. But. It isn't necessarily if there's some activity being done that's part of the general education. I so it, it could it could it could do both. Yes. My my some fear is about it being in the general education slot is that we're reducing general class size. To I mean that, the way I heard you talk about this before, and I'm not looking at the numbers clearly, is that you know you were pulling a little bit of square footage out of each of the general education classrooms to sort of make that square footage available for this pullout space. But if it's really, you know, we in Amherst do keep our special ed children at home, and it's something we're really proud of, and something I think is the right thing to be doing, um, but it does require um, an acknowledgement that we need more square footage to do that. And if we you know, don't give it its due, 
and, and we're kind of taking away from general education and we're squishing everything. Um, and then that spaces aren't really used for special education, they're not available to special education, um, then I'm, I'm afraid. So that's my, my fear of putting it, or being clear about what those spaces are and where they should land in this diagram. Yeah. Great, we may need to add, to your point, if we leave the breakout as uh, core academic, we may need to add a multi-use right. breakout for special education use. I, I, and I is there anything, like if, in talking with um, Jen Mack, was there any of the spaces that were sort of being used that way that are now currently labeled as special? I mean, I guess if those are the ones that are oversized right now that are just sort of filling up half the quads because there's not a classroom in them. I was not aware of any multi-use special education space at Fort River. Now it may have been we were asking them to define the use of each space. Uh -huh. you know. Um, right. But no, that didn't come up in that, that way. It was always a space was given to a certain type of staff member. So when you were talking with Jen Nack, like which specific spaces were you talking with her about? Just like the building blocks program and the Ames program, which to me is just in, you know, it's the special ed A, special ed B, and the special ed CR1. I mean, those are their primary spaces. And as far as I know, you know, those intensive programs aren't making use of of, you know, the, what's labeled as special, you know, but this right. is one parent's perspective that this no. is why we need the principal. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I generally agree there's only one small space, satellite space that they use outside of that suite. Which that's that's my room. memory as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we had all the staff there that mm -hmm. went through that's defining space. Each, each space and, and who is using it, what were they, how many people are in it, what is it being used for, um, and that's how that diagram got identified. This diagram. That, 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 yeah. that was purely based on the staff, the staff that were there, yeah. and they uh -huh. said what, how it was being used and what they needed. So did, in that meeting, were these sort of breakout spaces discussed? Everything. Every, yeah. every, well, I mean the um, sort of intended, you know, 150 feet of sort of well, I don't think we necessarily great, got great into the, 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 the fine detail of how much square footage, um, partly because, and I, I think there might be some rightness to this, that some of what's in the quads is kind of filling in the available space. Right. Um, I think you had a diagram or two of how some other options that other schools mm -hmm. might lay out. And so at a certain point, I mean, I want us to have a, a, an adequate discussion about you know, the pure numbers of this, but part of it also gets to looking at examples um, and it possibly at some point um, circling back to the faculty and saying, okay, this is what we thought we heard. Yeah. These are some diagrams yeah. real, you know, for you and not just generic ones. Did we hear right? Yeah, did these did work? Hear, exactly. We yeah. do need to do that. We do need right. to circle back. But uh, what I'm hearing right now is that we may have missed the breakout areas as general education areas, not not special ed areas. And there was a little discussion about that. I mean, I do believe the code taught that the teacher who specializes in the more special ed side of the code taught classrooms. I do believe they use those spaces to break. To take kids out, um, I think I thought I heard that, um, but I, I know what happens at least occasionally in my son's classroom. Um, so I think there is that component. I don't know what others remember from that conversation? I think they they might take out some kids, but also they will go to all the other rooms. Right. It's not that somebody that is content is going to only go to this other right. breakout room. I think there were multiple people that each one had their own office right now and they said, oh, sometimes they big one or two or sometimes they go there, sometimes they go yeah. there. So it's not that there's going to be kids sitting in those places all the time. I, I think if we do get these options illustrated and then circle back, I think there will be more clarity. Yeah. We still need to do that. And I think it's a way, I think if there's you know, plan diagrams for the faculty to look at, it's a way for them to, I think, get a little bit out of what they're used to doing. Um, because that's, I, 
I sensed a, a little, um, well, this is what we do. Yes. Um, and it's, it's awfully hard when you've been in a school for many years and always done it that way to, to really kind of step back and be a little bit more broad perspective about it. About possibility. About possibilities. Yeah. I think it would be good also to circulate the Quaker Farm. I think I, I really like the fact that there are multi-use spaces, that it's not that everybody is associated mm -hmm. this, in this room, this is what happens and only this can happen. I think they're having the flexibility of maybe grouping different, again, for space and savings, having the multi-use where people can go there to work instead of always. You're talking about the RTI. Yes. yes. So it sounds like the way we're envisioning, it sounds like the most comparable thing to what we have up here on the breakout teaching space is the RTI, right? Like, is that what you're saying? No. All right. No, okay. no, I'm saying instead of having all these lists, if you compare all the lists of special education, all the lists of rooms for the proposed versus um, Crocker Farm, it's very different components. Um, so I'm guessing some of this has to do by having multiple rooms instead of having one room yeah. per topic. We would have fewer rooms potentially if we went to an RTI like Crocker Farm. Okay. But then would, at the same time it would give you the opportunity of having a larger room instead of having two small ones you would have one larger group that you can bring a larger group sure. instead of having to have a third room that is larger because you might have a larger meeting in some other place. I don't feel like we've fully resolved this conversation. No, we haven't. No. I don't think we're going to resolve no. it, actually, because, <laughs> I mean, one, I think the point that was made a moment ago about trying to visualize mm -hmm. this makes sense. But two, there's also just, I hate to put it this way, but there's sort of a practical question. I mean, if you, if you take an illustration of what you're proposing back to the special education staff, and just the staff in general, to look at, they're going to, and then talk about how different spaces are conceptually programmed based on what you heard. They're either going to say, oh, that makes sense, or I tinker with it a little bit, or they'd say, oh my gosh, you missed all this, <laughs> you missed the kind of sure. space, and it may be nobody's fault, it may be they didn't talk about it, but then as they're visualizing the change, they say, you know, honestly, we could use another 150 square feet per classroom or something, or whatever it is, I'm just, or, or they won't say that. You'll, they'll find out when you get into the conversation. That will happen. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's I think that's a worthwhile thing. To, I think that's a worthwhile thing to do. But that's to me that's if we think there's an actual potential programming need that exists in the building, we need to come to we need to figure that out. In addition to the question of whether there are creative ways, as Aaron is suggesting, of solving that need, but we have to identify if the needs even there, or the, or is this in fact adequate and does in fact need, need there. We haven't done that. Test. No, I know that. That's okay. Yeah. And I suggest that, I mean, okay. looking, there's hardly anybody except for you guys that do architecture that's going to look at a space table and say, yes, I think. Right. And, and I'm going to tell you that it, is, it isn't always that easy on that yes. side of the table right. either to know <laughs> that you've hit it. But. Yeah. So I think we need to. Yeah. Yeah. I think one sure. other thing, I'm looking at this table, and my concern is that we are. This is designed for the current staff of, um, of what we were right now. And as we know, we are building for future, so it has to have flexibility. My concern is if we have too many small rooms, then it might not be useful in five years down the road. I think having rooms of different sizes with multiple purposes give us much more flexibility down the road, the road and we are not stuck with having cubicles or. Quite right. Quite right. Um, so I think we have to. Don't make the same mistakes of the past that we've taken because we have this list of in place right now that we have to have exactly the same thing. Maybe we have to be flexible because maybe we don't know what's going to happen in five years or ten years from now. So instead of having no walls, you don't want to have too many walls. I'm kind of kidding. Yes, yeah. no, but I have the walls not even need to distribute it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you could do is plan a, a, a building so that, let's say, there are modules of classroom sizes that you could easily subdivide and have different uses, but you could easily go back to a large room and right. it just makes sense for 20 pupils, 25 pupils. Right. Yeah. Okay. Not to move us, oh, oh just sorry. One tiny comment, yeah. I was just, um, 
interested to see that the, the special ed toilets currently are 22 square feet and the standard is 60 square feet. So, yeah, yes, terrible. they're really awful uh, for the special education toilet rooms. Yes, I agree. Okay, I think probably we beat this up enough for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, oh, did you have oh, Can I have one more comment on the table? Or Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick comment about the dining and food services. So yep. the square footage is the same, but instead of having a cafeteria, small room with 1,100 square foot, we have a stage of 1,000 square foot. So essentially, seating space gets reduced by 1,000 square foot. Between the proposed and what we have right now, we're, you're saying that you think the, we're dropping the stage. No, the, the, because it, the stage is a space that there is no seating in that area. Yes. So essentially, does it work? Have it going down? Because right now we have 36 total, 36 over 36 square feet for seating, and that's how the cafeterias work. Yeah. Okay. And right now we would go to. Um, 28, so more than 10%, 15% smaller than the current situation. Would that be something that works? I know that that's the suggested by the MSBA. And it's size based on um, feeding the school in two seatings, two so waves. The but you, but you the schools currently operate so three. there's two waves per room. Yes. So it's all scheduled sequentially, sort of. It doesn't all be green at the same time. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's actually six waves that are yeah. staggered. Six, six waves is waves what I remember from my notes. It's but. three and one, two and one, and one and one. So oh, that makes no sense. But that's, <laughs> that's six, right? Six. Yeah. Right. But the current limiter is the, the kitchen. Yeah, the kitchen's flow. tiny. Yeah. Right. So it's not that the seating is the constrictor right. that makes it not work currently. It's the the, the it's lines the through the kitchen. The service. The servery. The servery is undersized. Um, well, so we could fix that. Right. So it's not to, you know, to make, yeah. But would you be able, because my concern is having three seatings for... Two seatings. Would we have be able to fit two seatings? Because usually now they separate by grade, so that would mean that you have mixed grade seating. Yeah, and I don't know sense. if that's something that goes with the district. I don't know. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand what your, your question is. So right now in the dining you have uh, 36 square foot, so you have... But that, Oh, I see. If you add those two together, right? right. If you add those Thank two you. together, because the the three are used. Thank you. Yeah. Um, whereas the, the, my issue is how the district does it, the school does it. We would have to change that. We would have to go mix grades, and that's something to us again, the principal. And I Diane, believe that there are mixed. I mean, I'm a crocker. I think there's mixed grades. I don't think there's. It's it's not just like okay, all first graders eat. No, I, yeah. I, it's, okay. it's more in, than one In Whitewood, they do one cafeteria, one grade, no. and they... Yeah, yeah well, it's, 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 it's sized for two seatings to do the entire school. You certainly have the flexibility to go one grade at a time to do more seatings. Right. Uh, you have more than That's enough. True. <laughs> or split the grades. Yeah. The, yeah. the lower grades and upper grades. You yeah. could do that. Okay. Again, yeah. the, maybe the visual will help. Yeah. And, I remember something Diane said. She said something like, I would love to have only two seatings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Direct quote from Diane. So, yeah. yes, yeah. speaking for her right now. <laughs> okay. That would, that would uh, work for the custodians. <laughs> <laughs> Put you down for a yes vote there? Yeah. I think yes. Okay. Shall we move on to some diagrams? Yes. Sure. yes sir. So, attached to this chart are several diagrams. We have uh, a site plan and we have floor plans. Um, three different options, so... Is it necessary or helpful for me to pull it up here? Do you have it all in front of you? I don't no. think so, actually. Okay. No. Um, then I like my one so question is, is we for do have a our camera. camera. For the the camera. Can you get it? I'm for yeah. pointing to things. Yeah. For the public? Okay. <laughs> I think it would be good. Okay. How could we place that? Yes. It was like really big and missed that wall before. Okay. Do you want to walk us through? Sure. Um, the first two diagrams are the existing site and the existing building. This is the existing site. Um, we understand you currently have 
Um, actually, seven buses that drop off at the school. We've illustrated six because one leaves early, but um, you could fit the seventh here if you needed to. So the current drop off is large enough for your buses, which basically works. Uh, the vehicular drop off is not so great in the current situation. You're bringing the cars in towards this back corner. I understand the students are let out from this door um, behind the. Um, it's actually kind of from the middle of that cafeteria block. Oh, is it from the middle of the block? Not from there, no, but from the, the, the Oh, right, right there, right there. Yeah, yes. okay. Right, and, <laughs> and they come covered. around the corner, and then parents can pick yep. them up. But there's Only not... for, we go to the parking lot for pickup. There is no lineup for pickup. There is a lineup for drop-off. For drop-off. Okay, for so drop-off. So kids are handed hand with their parents to their car, and they're parked in the parking lot. Or because in hand this hand town, hand. you sign out, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So, so parents are, so parents leave the car. Go to the cafeteria. Get yeah. the child and then walk out. Yeah. Okay. But for drop off, this situation happens, which the queue, yeah. I was told, is not very long, anyways. Five or six dropping yeah. off. It's not a big deal. Okay. And then there's three vans, which I'm told also drop off in this parking lot. Um, I suppose they could also go to the lower one if they needed to. But that's, that's our understanding right now. Um, the only question I have about the buses is well, I guess by the inherent nature of what we're going to do, um, things are going to change but if we were a bigger population is there enough bus drop off if we really were at 420 we need I don't know bus. how many extra buses that is but yeah. but do you know about one how many buses there um, no. six. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. six seven six or seven yeah, yeah. so how full other buses right now it, it varies wildly well, I think there's <laughs> one bus that is very full and 50. the yeah. other ones are not so okay. there's one bus line that's very full, but not the others. Okay. Um, well, we can make an extrapolation and add a bus or so. Um, or if, you, if we can work with someone who can tell us the answer, um, that would also be great. Um, it's a good question. Uh, we also noticed that you have paved play around the gym, a pretty large area with basketball courts. You have some playgrounds um, next to the gym, which are at least one of them is sort of uh, overgrown with weeds at this point. And then there's a paved play area near the cafeteria, which is, of course, the opposite end of the school. There's this um, <coughs> restroom building here, um, which serves the fields. And then there's playgrounds, um, 5 through 12 play um, around the paved play area. Um, and then in the fields, it looks like you have two baseball fields, but there are also a couple soccer fields imposed um, back in this area and a soccer field here, which didn't make it into our diagram, but we're aware of them. There's also a third baseball field. Is there? It's oh, sorry. the worst one. Um, but it's uh, below that top right. It's underneath it. It's just, just got a backstop. That, oh, like over here? Yes. OK. Yes. <coughs> so home runs go into the parking lot. OK. Yeah. I didn't even see that. Um, yeah. That's good to know. OK, and you have 180 parking spaces, approximately. And I hear that's adequate. Um, that counts under 100, so it's sufficient. Um, the school, we've handed it out before. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to walk you through the school now, I think. I think I better move on uh, and talk about it quite a bit. So let's keep going. The weekend parking, certainly people back up definitely in parallel park oh. all along that drive. But as far as I know, it's never spilled out all the way onto the um, no, side. yeah, I've never seen it's it. But uh, when the soccer fields the are side. full, this yeah. whole zone is, oh, you know, people park all the way up the driveway. What I can't remember is if people actually take the effort to park down the far end or not off the channel oh. next Saturday. <laughs> Would you have more than 180 people for soccer? Yeah, uh, certain times of the day, it just seems like there's a lot of kids and a lot of parents and grandparents come, but um, yeah. I don't so, know how much of it's laziness and how much of it's actual just character of the site. I'm just so checking why would there seven time. buses? Seven. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll work with seven for our 420 scheme and I think that would be pretty accurate for the studies. Um, so then here's our, our first study and um, this is our uh, renovation. It's our sort of uh, lightest touch. Um, we're working with the existing building area and we're adding on a little bit um, at each end of the cafeteria wing. Um, so it begins with the site plan. Um, site plan is 
very similar. We still have the main entry where it currently is in this. Um, so this is substantially the same. We're now showing seven buses, which obviously fits. Um, we reconfigured the um, drop-off. Oh, sorry. Um, because we're creating a pre-K entry, and these are the new pre-K classrooms here. And similar to Crocker Farm, we noticed that the students are um, being picked up and dropped off from the pre-K entry door. So we thought, well, maybe that works all right and could, could also work here. Um, because it ends up, in terms of our interior layout, working out best that way. Uh, so we have a pre-K playground that we'd be creating near the, near the pre-K entry and pre-K school. Um, the other difference is this option proposes creating a new 6,000 square foot gym uh, at this location, uh, at the end of the cafeteria. And so we have one large paved play area now, and then uh, a 5 through 12 playground that serves grades 1 through 6. Um, so it consolidates a lot of that paved play and playground area into one location. So let's look at the floor plan briefly. And, and bear in mind, these are, these are really programming studies at this point. We, we hesitate to call them the design in any way. Um, but it's, it's proving we can fit all of the spaces within a certain footprint. The total footprint here is 83,800 square feet, which is very close to what we're targeting on that spreadsheet. Um, we, we made a much larger courtyard at the center of the existing building, which is effective at bringing light into a lot of the rooms that border the courtyard, and also could be a great um, outdoor or learning courtyard. We could have educational program there that's perhaps uh, adjacent to the media center here, uh, which, which could open up onto the courtyard. And so in taking away some square footage, We've added some square footage as well. Um, the gym, as I mentioned before, in the upper corner, and then the pre-K classrooms creating a pre-K suite um, here in the bottom right corner, adjacent to the administration, but still a little bit pulled away from the rest of the school with its own entry and sort of identification to, um, to cars and buses um, on this side. So um, that, was, that was kind of one idea. Um, the way this zones out is academic is in this U shape. Uh, we've, we've put walls into the open classrooms to create corridors, dividing the quads basically in half. Uh, and all of the classrooms have daylight uh, because we've created this courtyard. Uh, and they're grouped by, by grade. We were saying we wanted to cluster by grade, um, but also be sequential because we know that sometimes instead of having three classes per grade, we'll need four, so we can, we can grab a classroom adjacent from, from the next grade and it'll still sort of be in the same area. Uh, so it begins with kindergarten and wraps around the sixth grade here by the, by the main entry. Um, right, I have a couple overall diagrams that would be useful. So, Stepping back from all that detail a little bit, we just color coded the major zones because it's kind of more important right now. Um, we have the academic and support zone, it's this U shape, as I just described. We have the district wide special education in yellow um, here, um, just the courtyard kind of at the center of the school. We have the public core, so that's your media center, cafeteria, gym, art and music. Um, spaces that you want to let the public into after hours. Um, and so by moving the gym, we're able to include it in the public core. When it's back in this area, it's sort of, it's, you have to separately enter and exit um, if you want to have a public access. So that was, that was a benefit in our views. If you move the gym, it can be part of a public core. We'd envision doors, which could be locked after hours, that would stop people from going into the academic um, spaces. And then, of course, the administration, front and center, with a view of the site, as well as um, right at the front door, we have the, the general office and the nurse right when you come in. Um, and then the next diagram is just a quantification of new construction versus renovation versus demolition. And I think I've basically described the content of the slide already. So I'm going to keep moving. Uh, 
you had another next sort of idea. Right? Yeah, should we stop on the first one? And if you, I have one question. Sure. But we can hold them. Um, toilet rooms. I just look for those myself. They're all yes. the teams. There's three sets. Yeah, we, we created so some. It, so you did pull them out of the classrooms. Yeah. Yep. But those bunk outs are still there. We retained them in the pre-K classrooms and in the kindergarten classrooms, uh, but for the upper grades, they would be using. Um, uh, okay, right. Toilet. So the kindergarten is not where the kindergarten. So yeah, it's different. Right. We would have to create a toilet room in this location. So then they could be made accessible and. All yeah, those. absolutely. We yes. we in this kind of level of analysis, we're just trying to zone the square footage just correctly. Yeah. We don't show any custodial closets or bathrooms. I assure you that they will be. Yeah, I just, just in con, uh, conceptualizing that the classrooms do get to now benefit from a lot more frontage than they did before because yes. the, part of the problem with the current thing is we've got limited peri perimeter as it is. Right. And yes. You put the toilet rooms on the perimeter and you've yeah. got even less. Yes. Right. yes. And then they're just not big enough for the current function. So, yeah, we're moving that. We're, we're do, doing something really different. Yes. yes. Great. My question on, on this scheme. Is is our kitchen servery basically the same thing we have? We, we don't so far. We don't have a real improvement on that. And I realize we're early days here, but that's it's a good point. It's a good point. We're just kind of understanding the server is the problem. I think the kit. I I have never talked to the kitchen staff, but my guess is it's a little undersized in general. But yeah. from the sounds of it, getting kids through that servery is not ideal. Yeah, we did reconfigure the cafeteria in the one large space, and we added a stage um, consistent with our program sheet, um, which is then adjacent to the music area, which consists of the music room and then an orchestra and band room. And then we also have an instrument storage room adjacent to the stage. So these being <coughs> near each other all works pretty well, conceptually. But the kitchen, yeah, we would want to think more about that. And the cafeteria is landlocked, right? There's no daylight there. Because like over by the band and orchestra, right, there's skylights because that that part of the building had a weird bump up right in there, right? Yeah, these those were, two spaces. Right, but these, the cafeteria is still the same same ceiling as everything else. Right. Currently. It's very similar to where it is right now. It doesn't okay. have much natural light. I think it's a little from this courtyard, which we're turning into a stage. Um, so for a performance point of view, it's it's probably good, but it's, yeah, it'd be nice to bring a window into the cafeteria for sure. Or at least some clear story, which you could still probably do, but you probably could require some Sky demolition. Yeah. I think yeah. the cafeteria in uh, Parker Farm has clear stories, which work very well. Yeah, and often makes a big difference. Yeah. Uh, space. Sure. I just right. have a question about a couple of light boxes that don't seem to go anywhere. Um, between the fifth and sixth grade classroom, that is a rectangular white box, and then there's another one between the general office and the sixth grade classroom. Just are those like double doors or something? I, I, okay, I just, so this one yeah, is intended that? to be the entry vestibule. Okay. Yes. And if we had doors, it would really help you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because right now it's like this is the place you can't get. Yeah. We should identify. Well, you can't get into any of these spaces actually. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. The doors are overrated. Very expensive. Is there another one an entrance to the large <laughs> courtyard or? No, this is some additional space we have. We were lining walls up on the columns, and I, I think we need to allocate this to some use. Uh, okay. And fair enough, it's okay. a draft. Uh, yeah, no, no I, I thought it, I just didn't know if it was Storage. Necessary. Yeah, storage. Yeah, storage. Yeah. Yeah. But it has windows. It's a pizza. The engineer would grab that in a heartbeat for a technology closet or electric closet. Yeah. yeah. So I think I made this comment before. My concern is the third grade classrooms that they have the high ceilings that's where the gym is right now so either we're going to have to lower the ceiling put the second floor for storage of everything up there that could be a solution for our storage because mm -hmm. having classrooms with the right. gym we were, we were ceilings right. but it would be an awkward situation where we have a huge volume and then we lower it and we have a fake well we would not right. i mean uh, it would be an awkward room to have a very high ceiling it's just would feel awkward, so we would have to lower it. Yeah, but then, so you would demolish part of it. This would be demolish or make a fake ceiling and have yeah, an empty. Yeah, we just hang a ceiling. So yeah, there's a lost opportunity there. That there's a lot of yeah. volume that we're not taking advantage of in this option. Correct. 
we got a little bit storage there. <laughs> Possibly. I don't know if you have the height though, Pete. But I, I think placing the gym on the other side of the building makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. In terms yeah. of zoning the square footage. After school. Yeah, cars can access from that side. Right. It's, it's a good place for it. My only comment is on the boiler room. What I know of engineers is they like a more space than that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we haven't discussed this with the engineer. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, don't do that. Like three times yeah. be more pressure from them. Like, <laughs> well, exactly. So we started low and then let me. Because otherwise, yeah. You have to negotiate. Exactly. You just give it away. This is just our opening gambit. Should I move on to the yeah. next one? Yes. Um, Second option is a, is a larger addition, but it's still a renovation scheme. Um, we have a, a two-story addition, which um, ends up on the south side of the existing building. And then we remove a, a good portion of the existing building at this end on the north end. Um, so that's the general mass end. In terms of the site, um, it's all very preliminary, but we, we kept the same sort of drop-off that you have now. The main entry should be shifted down a little bit and we created a pre-K entry where the current main entry is. Um, and so then we have, again, some parking at the south side of the building and paved and paved play and uh, the main playground also at the south side of the building adjacent to the cafeteria and the gymnasium. Uh, so it's a similar diagram. This one, because we've remove so much of the building footprint, we really have a more compact footprint overall here, which is a benefit to this option. Um, anytime you build two stories, that's going to happen. Um, we've we snuck in a soccer field over here. It could be a baseball field, um, possibly. Um, so continue on for now. Um, yes. Moving to the floor plan. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, having a side conversation, I should do that. But I think it's something just worth noting. Um, Christine had asked me if Fort Worth is a polling station. Is a polling station, um, and given you know modern security around schools, they literally have to have a constable, or I forget what the correct term for the person is, mm -hmm. to sit there by the door and open the door for you to let you in because it's just one of the regular exterior doors. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a particularly awkward arrangement. And they use the gymnasium. And they use the gymnasium, which of, of course means. I like was, the gymnasium. Right, and, and no gym that day and all that kind of stuff. Yes, yes. Um, right. Just going to go ahead and keep going here. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Core academic spaces are uh, the um, north side. Uh, we have the early education, pre K. We have kindergarten, first and second grade at the north side of the building. Uh, and then um, in the new addition, we have a new cafeteria and kitchen uh, with the stage. We have new music rooms, uh, new receiving area, and then new district special education spaces, and a new gymnasium. Um, and so in terms of, and the media center ends up right in the center, adjacent to another internal courtyard, which we um, cut out of the existing building. Um, administration right in front again, with the nurse and the general office flanking the main entry doors. Um, going to the second floor, um, is the upper education, upper, uh, we have third grade through sixth grade, um, and we have some support spaces. The zoning of this one, we have again the administration right at the front entry. We have our public spaces, gym, cafeteria, media center, art and music, all sort of zoned in the um, right side of the building once you come in the doors. And then we have some the academic on, at the, the left side when you come in the doors. Again, we've envisioned doors that would um, separate those areas from the more publicly accessed areas. And also the district special education could have a set of doors um, so that it could be zoned off. Um, and then we have our quantities of new construction, renovation, and demolition, which we can take a look at. And then our third option is our new building option. Can I just um, 
just a quick question. I see oh, stairs yes. at either end for that second floor. Where is the elevator? Oh, yes, the elevator is lacking. It, it would go in this area. Okay. Um, and we, it, it definitely would be an elevator, obviously. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I have to leave at 8. I don't think that's the agenda. That's okay. <laughs> Are there any votes or anything that needs to happen? Uh, let me quickly scan my, my, my thing. I don't think so. I don't we're okay. think okay. you've so set this okay. invoice yet, but I've seen some wooden vote on that. What? We didn't send you an invoice? It hasn't gotten to us yet okay. for voting. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And yeah, I think we still have four invoices. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I'm going to hang All right. I did. All Sorry. It's 10 5 10. Okay, um, any other thoughts on this option? Should I move to the last form? And then you could always come back if you need to. Um, the last one's a new building. I should probably start on the site. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead to 5A. Um, so the, if you can see it, there's a faint outline of the existing building here. Uh, we're proposed, proposing building a new building to the south of it. We have two possible orientations for it. This one is, is better, we think, for energy purposes um, in that most of the classrooms are facing south or north. Um, it's a little, it's maybe a little awkward when you come in, and it's something we could look at flipping. We were just talking about that. I see it now, Randall. Uh, oh, yep. <laughs> but we put all the entry and the vehicular circulation on the south side, um, and we have all the 170, 180 spaces that, that you currently have. We were able to separate the buses into a bus loop, which is perhaps a little bit better than what you have now, so that car pedestrians can, can be separated from that and sort of this main promenade here to the front entry, which offers a lot more dropping off space, but you may not even need all of that uh, based on your current use. We also have a separate pre-K entry, um, which is allowing separate vehicular circulation for the pre-K, which seems like an advantage to us and is working better in our new our new option than in our renovation option. Um, the gymnasium and the cafeteria end up towards the fields on this side of the building. So we have paved play directly adjacent to cafeteria and gym with the playgrounds there. And then at this end, the service, with, uh, which also needs to serve the kitchen for kitchen trash, is, is adjacent. Uh, and so that works pretty well. Um, and then this is the alternative orientation. Um, maybe this is a little stronger as you approach. You see the front of the building um, a, little, a little more directly. It's really a similar diagram. Now the pre-K entry is moved to the side, um, to the south side. And the gym and cafeteria on the north side, um, sharing paved play and playground space. Um, I'm going to move into the floor plan really briefly. Um, so the, the main entry to the new building would be right in the center here. Um, it's adjacent to the general office and the nurse station, and the uh, <coughs> administration suite is, is right there as well. Um, and then we have academic areas um, at, at the, um, to the left we have the pre-K and kindergarten, the, early education. Um, we have custodial and um, cafeteria kitchen here adjacent to the gymnasium um, with a stage that operates both to the gym and to the cafeteria as Richard was just alluding to uh, earlier. Uh, and then we have this suite for specials. We have art, music, uh, media center, computer lab. And then um, we, we tried something a little different here. We, we separated the sixth grade from uh, first through fifth. Uh, we noticed that that's how it was at Crocker Farm. Principal Shea said that was kind of a good thing, actually, that um, sixth grade is, is sort of moving on and gets to have a little bit of autonomy in the school. So that's something we tried in this option. Um, and then upstairs, you have the rest of the um, core academic spaces, first grade through fifth grade. And we put the um, district special education spaces upstairs. Um, looks like this one did get an elevator, so that's good. <laughs> um, and we also have a good amount of support spaces um, here. Um, 
it's, it's, it's a lot to digest, and we don't expect any action on these options, but we would like your um, thinking about these as yes. pros and cons. Um, and if you could get back to us, it could be through you, Jonathan, as uh, the keeper of all the questions and answers, and then we can get back to you with answers or update the time that we need. Great. So um, all of the designs that we've seen are for 420 enrollment. Correct. We went to the outer Right. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering how the 360 would look with these, because I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at the 86,000 square feet, and I'm concerned. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I'm not saying, like, well, the solution is decreasing enrollment. I mean, I think we have to maybe, we'll have to talk about bringing that down or at least discuss it. But I'm curious about how, it, it, uh, do, the, do the overall designs change if you're working on 360? Overall, no. Uh, we would have fewer classrooms. Cafeterias might not be that different. Gymnasium won't be that much different. Uh, again, we'd be working toward the MSBA guidelines. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, conceptually, you know, Jesse, you kind of organize them based on the, you know, the, the public use spaces and the classroom blocks. So those classroom blocks typically will, will reduce, the public use spaces will reduce less so. Uh, but, but even the, the classroom side will, will not reduce a lot. But there will be there will be a reduction without a doubt, and that's that's probably an exercise that we should we should evaluate. Assuming these options in general seem like a direction that that we kind of like, then we can see what happens to them as the enrollment goes down. But if some of these were like just you know, forget it, there's no point in exploring that. Then that's kind of why we haven't gone that far yet. Okay. Other general comments, questions? So think of them as uh, minimal. Additions, yep. and the additions really are tried to getting the building zoned correctly uh, to sort of a 50-50 scheme in the middle, and then complete replacement. Now we haven't done a phasing analysis. There will be a big difference. In yeah. See, Richard phasing. raises a really good point, and, and Justin and I talked about this. I think I don't know. I think Richard were involved in that conversation as well, and about the phasing of the minimal option where we're creating that large courtyard. That will be difficult to accomplish uh, in an occupied building without, I and mean, we have to go through the analysis, but our, our sense is that it may end up costing as much as uh, the medium option, for example, because we may need 12 portable classrooms to pull that off, to free up enough space that we can keep people away from the construction area, because it's too much we feel to be done in one summer to demolish the interior and come back and get the enclosure in and so that means you're going to be impacting almost the entire school footprint for some period of time uh, and we think so there may be a, a phasing implication to that that may make that option less viable which we'll, we'll test. Well I have sort of two comments I'm going to say, the, I'm going to say one in response right to that and then I'll hopefully not forget my other question but I think we need to look at one that doesn't then do that even though I like that big courtyard, I mean, that's what I like about that scheme is it brings yep. lots of natural light in. But I think we need to see the contrast of, okay, if we don't cut a big hole that makes us buy 12 or rent 12 classrooms, yep. what, what does that look like? Because I think it's it's going to be hard for us to assess sure. um, well, that. Even without the courtyard, you're still dealing with a phased renovation. Yep. So that is true. you may still need portable classrooms to create And, and that might be but, all the answer I need in the end. but. Yeah. Um, my gut says that we may get questions if, if it's not looked at. Sure. So, so am I hearing try an even minimal approach? Well, that, that gets to my second question, which is, okay, so we want to, we're not going through the MSBA process, but does this hit the right, what, what they would expect you, the, the, the spectrum of renovation, addition, um, new construction, is this, this, are we within the, the book ends? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I think that's a good question. Yeah. So, so you know, without, without doing a whole lot of uh, work on the option you just described, which is right. to not cut the big hole, that is not unlike, I believe Jesse sent you the plans of what we did uh, in East Granby, of that 
and that's exactly what we did. We, we, it's a deep footprint, and it, it stayed kind of the way it was, and kind of the way you have now, which okay. is so the you know you have your library media center retains that was. center position because you know you can't put a classroom in there without windows, uh, and then then it's about partitioning up the perimeter around that, um, and we can certainly see what that looks like, but but conceptually that's kind of what you're going to end up with. Is it grand? That grand be like third part smaller? Yes, much smaller. Yeah, much smaller. It's not as wide. Yes. Yes. By a third. It is so, much more. So the idea, I mean, I don't think comparing and saying, oh, it would be the same as Granby, it's... Well, no, I mean, just conceptually, you're going to have the library center in the center, and then, and then the spaces that we can, that can live without windows, whether it's the toilets and, and storage, and you know, you're going to have to fill up the middle with as much of that stuff as you can. Uh, and you still, that's what the study will demonstrate, is whether we have enough of that stuff or whether we're still left with a lot of square footage that we're going to have to then use for classrooms or something that we'll do without windows, which then becomes kind of a deal breaker. Like it, it just sort of doesn't work, right. and, and that's what we would have to test. I have two comments about the facing. I would think when we are thinking about the facing, how the the third quad or the third or the fourth quad or the two like in Fort Rivers and the third two use for special education that. Actually, one well, many times there are the four quads used for classrooms, so there you can have in the four uh, classrooms placed right now. So maybe start looking at how moving people within the building to the to the four quads that can be included in the facing. We don't have to move everybody out, sure. but maybe compact them into a more efficient use of the space. We'll just try to phase and it internally. Maybe try to, to use as much as internally yep. we can. And the other one is also use the existing courtyards because there are courtyards that could be something else. So instead of having a big courtyard, can we expand the courtyards that we have and actually put windows because there are courtyards that you hidden courtyards. I don't know how they were designed. Secret courtyard. Yeah, almost secret, <laughs> the secret garden. Yes, like the secret garden. Uh, but maybe look at the idea of how can we use the existing courtyards. Instead. That would be instead of a big intervention or huge yep. courtyard, maybe do smaller interventions in the courtyards that we have right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, two two thoughts. Um, I like that um, you were thinking of having the gym and the cafeteria be, because they are more public spaces be together. I wonder if I mean you have everything moving south. I don't know if um, uh, it, it makes sense to entertain anything where the cafeteria moves north. Um, and it kind of that dovetails with um, another question I have is that, you know, renovating spaces, it, different types of spaces cost more or less to renovate. Sure. So um, uh, if there are spaces that can be preserved that wouldn't, you know, to look at it from the perspective of, uh, yeah, I can renovate this space, this, this 5,000 feet for X amount, but it'll cost twice as much if I sure. renovate this kind of space. So, what sh are there spaces we should keep as is? I, I don't know. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm asking. We'd have to do that analysis. Yeah. But, but obviously, if we repurposing square footage and tearing out okay. partitions, that that compounds the renovation. Right. We can we can limit the renovation to existing partition locations. Then it's simple. Talk about the phasing and trying to do it with an occupied building. Maybe think of um, do we have um, hazardous materials? Um, like in all your assessments, we were talking about structural, and but I didn't see like hazardous materials come across because I think didn't the district has something. Was a, right? It must have been a hero report somewhere. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think it was done. Didn't you, uh, my person do one? Yeah. I believe yeah. asbestos in that. So that'd be something we definitely want to get included yeah, in the do. report, and yeah. you know, it makes me very cautious about a building of this vintage, built in the '60s, the early '70s. Like that was the height of the the crappiest building material, the most poisonous building materials we could put in buildings. That's that's the building. They thought it was um, good material. They thought so they really did. Um, so renovating in an occupied building that seems hazardous based on general knowledge of buildings of that vintage. It, it, but it complicates the phasing even more so because you have to do all the abatement basically in the summers. Yeah. So you have to come in and maybe abate a space that you won't get to renovate for nine months. And so there may be students in a space 
for example, where the floor has been abated and, and you just have a rough concrete floor until you can get in there, or the ceilings had to come down to get the glue daubs, and, and so you have a lot of space that you're not going to be working on and it looks kind of a mess until you can get there. And in an occupied building, it, 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 yeah, I mean, it just lends to the unease of the occupants while they're all in there. And particularly in the school with their issues or their bed concerns about the quality of the environment. That's not going to help. Um, so those are all things that we have to be sensitive to and, and may play a larger role as, as we decide what option makes the sense. Uh, typically, you know, the implications of, of phasing and the, and the impact on the occupants during the construction period and how disruptive it will be. A lot of communities we work with, that's one of the highest criteria. You know, we're not, we're not going to sacrifice, you know, two years of students' education, uh, you know, to, to get this building built if there's another way to do it without doing that. And that's kind of an extreme position, but, but it, there, there will be disruptions, and, and so that may very well be a factor that will weigh heavily. Eric? So I'm going to go, I'm going back to, based on, especially based on our, go ahead. Okay. I just have a very general comment about um, form following parking. It looks like site planning is a really important part of these three um, schemes and entries and access. And I would like to see just some um, more thought given to vehicular turning radiuses on the site plans and how they influence it. And I'm also wondering um, how the parking counts were arrived at and if we're just, if that's part of an MSB. Standard or not? You can answer. You can answer. Yeah. It, it's not part of a standard, mm -hmm. so um, it's kind of intuitive, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's based upon what we have observed there. Mm -hmm. It's based upon other experience we've had in schools. Mm -hmm. um, we've matched your existing parking count. Yeah. yeah. I think the, and I'm not sure how it happens at Fort River. Um, but at Wildwood, certainly, when there's curriculum night, open houses, or any other, you know, full school events, yeah, well, see, it's really challenged, and I'm wondering about how that impacts overflow parking and other. Yeah, see, traditionally, you 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 know, you don't build up better or worse. You don't provide parking for those events, uh, and and quite frankly, that's a, a more green strategy. I mean, nobody wants to pave the world for the three times a year. That doesn't negate the fact that those events occur and they have to park cars. And so whether that's, uh, you know, shoulders, uh, you know, along access drives or grassy areas that could double, uh, I mean, those are realities and we do have to kind of get our arms around that a little bit. Uh, so it's, you know, points well taken. So I'd love to, I mean, I can go back to something Jonathan said a while ago at the beginning around alternatives for renovating or it's not really alternatives I'm really saying thinking through the process of understanding what the implications of doing either a renovation or a partial demolition or renovation uh, on the existing building and sort of principles we keep in in the front of our minds on that so I'm, I'm assuming that having natural light in all the classrooms at the end of this process in, is going to be a top principle that we're going to look to do that regardless of what area we end up with. Um, and, and that there are other means of getting natural light into the building in general that's going to be considered important to do. Um, and I'm just saying if there are other principles you're thinking of or that you're thinking of, I, it'd be good for us to talk about them because I'm not, I'm not really, speaking for myself, I'm not really interested in coming up with alternative scenarios for the building, that then you look at it, you look at the compromise that's made and say, well, why the hell do we do that, right? I mean, this isn't really a building we, we really would want to have. Oh, we did it because of this reason or that reason. And, I, and I'm saying that's important because if you're going to start looking for alternative scenarios for renovation or partial demolition or renovation, then it's <coughs> then once you're starting to make compromises based on what you think, the, what the existing conditions are and phasing and how you do that, there has to be some sort of hierarchy of principle you're keeping in mind of saying what are we willing to try to trade off and what do we think is a deal breaker. And you could check with us for some of the deal breakers, mm -hmm. but some of them you're going to know in your own professional judgment. You would not personally recommend a building of X sort or Y sort. So I think that's, I think that's really, really important. The next thing for me on that is thinking about what the phasing would be 
under any variety of scenarios. I mean, if you're if you're doing very significant, and I'm assuming <coughs> if you're adding insulation to the building or changing the basic heating and ventilating and wiring systems and things like that in the building, even if you leave existing walls up and don't do significant creation of new courtyards, um, you're going to be really stripping down the areas that you're working in and substantially rebuilding them. Um, so there's going to be implications for phasing anyway, as well as also with materials existing and all that kind of stuff. And I think it'd be important to go through that to some extent um, when thinking about what alternative, in other words, when we're thinking about narrowing down the range of what proposed renovation alternatives we we're looking at, we should be looking at it also in that context because it seems to me that's, you know, those two sides of it. How are we going to do this and what are the trade-offs and how is the process of doing it? And then what are the end goal we're trying to get and what are we compromising away in terms of satisfying the existing structure? Make sense? I think so. Um, let me try to paraphrase some of this. Yeah. So let's say in the minimum, minimal approach, you are able to reprogram all of the spaces and get your curriculum satisfied by just reassigning spaces and minimizing the amount of walls that you remove. You still have to address the roof. You still have to address the mechanical system. So you're going to be tearing down ceilings, for example, to get access to all that mechanical system. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's not going to be a paint job. It's going to be more than a paint job. And uh, I don't know what that, that minimum is, but it's, it's it's that's that's one end of the like, yeah, and, and part part of the reason I mentioned I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no. But part of the part of the reason I mentioned that just because is if if the disruption to the existing building activity is substantial under any circumstance, then tearing out a few walls and putting in a courtyard may not actually be. I mean, it may be, but it may not actually be as big an issue as you might suggest if under the ordinary non no new courtyard scenario. You're still tearing, you're out, still tearing out everything out, <laughs> exactly. and, that, and, and exactly. there are not going to be any kids and staff in that section of the building under any circumstance. Right? Yeah, you're um, absolutely that right. And that's, a, that's a very good <coughs> observation that what appears to be a huge intervention, which is creating that courtyard, may actually be relatively minor when you consider everything else that needs to be done just to bring the building up to speed. So we should look at a base repair option, which is perhaps just making those. Um, modifications that are completely necessary and we'll get a cost for that and a phasing implication that we could then bounce, you know, here's the courtyard, costs so much more. Well, that doesn't seem that bad. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, that goes back to what, like, was Jonathan was earlier saying. Like, if we're presenting, we're really getting apples to oranges here when we're talking about, and, and or you were saying, you were saying, like, if you present something to the public, why wouldn't everybody just say, well, why don't if if it's if it's fee, if it's feasible and possible to have a building that you know is a paint job? To, right, satisfies the program is half the cost. Why wouldn't we just do it? Yeah. Well, because and it's hard to communicate right. to the public that that there's a quality of education that we're missing out on mm -hmm. if we present this as a viable option. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should be presenting anything that's not a well, yes and no. I mean, we, we do a lot of these studies, and typically at the end, there's, there is some matrix, some criteria that, that just like you were talking about, that we evaluate these options against. Disruption to occupants during construction, cost, uh, achieves educational uh, objectives, uh, you know, daylight, uh, you know, is energy efficient. But, you know, it could be less of 10, and, and good, better, best, or, or yes, no, and Right, and then you go through and, and say the option where we address all the mechanical issues, we just close up all the open spaces and, and adjust the program within the existing footprint. Okay, maybe it meets the educational specification, but you know, from an energy standpoint, it's still horrible. We still have lots of rooms without daylight, uh, you know, and, and so it's and that's a deal breaker for the committee. So that option was dis dismissed. And it's important to do that because someone will ask, just like you did. Why didn't you look at that? Well, why didn't you look at that? You know, you say, matter of fact, we did. And it was dismissed, and these are the reasons why it was dismissed. Well, and, oh, one, okay. and one of the things that under it, though, is that if you could show that base, uh, base case, point out the deficiencies in it, but also say the disruption to the building would actually already be so significant anyway that you're not saving that much right. in terms of the disruption to the building. I mean, I'm not saying... I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. No, you do the analysis yeah, and find yeah. out if that's true. Exactly. But if it's true, then it would make it, it would strengthen the case that 
Yeah, There's what's the value at that point? Yeah. It's so disruptive and it's, you know, it's so much work. I mean, for, for an incremental difference of cost, you can make all those things go away and get exactly what you want. I mean, that's the kind of creation you need to make. Right. So one of the questions that you asked is, uh, is everything that you're presenting going to be something that the MSBA requires that you do? And the one thing that we haven't talked about and that I think maybe being tossed around right now is, is a code upgrade. And that's, in fact, something that you do have to present. Just says we are up to code now. Um, and but what the we'll, cost to get up to code. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I don't know that that's something that we want, to, we do. want to, right. to, to look at because, in fact, some of the baseline things are getting rid of the open classrooms, getting the daylight, right? Those are, those are already our minimums. So I don't think we need to go there. So that's one thing. The other is that um, when whatever designs you come up with, and I, I didn't look at these with an eye toward it tonight, but we have our current enrollment right now, right? And we have ideas about what it might be. But this is something that's going to last us at least 50 years. And if, as demographics do, if we go back up and this all of a sudden 10 years from now has to accommodate 100 more kids, where do we put them? How do we add that on? Is is there flexibility in the design to put it add it in a logical place? Yeah, we do need right. to include that in the planning as future expansion, the potential for future expansion. We do have to show that. You're quite right. okay. I'm just going to play timekeeper for a moment. It's 8:20. Uh, I don't want to cut off things prematurely. I also want to make sure we give you some direction. I'm going to scan my list for things we should probably just touch on as many. Um, but I also know that we have questions. I have two comments. One, is it okay in the model of the new construction, all new construction, you have the special education programs on the second floor? Um, would that be okay with the current programs, are, or if the other programs in the building, would that be okay to have it on the second floor? Um, it would be fully accessible. Yeah. It's fully accessible. And if we're treating our special education kids as an integrated model, they should be welcome in any part of the building. Correct. So yeah. they should be welcome in any part of the building. Yeah, but it's not just for some mobility. Mobility. I'm thinking that in one would the, there is some issues, some kids with more mobility issues, so getting to the second floor would be more problematic, mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking. Sure. So I don't, I don't, we don't know if they're going to be stable. Mm -hmm. In would so this would forbid those kids from being uh, from being. What's uh, the nature no. of the disability that they uh, No, well, you need you need hundred percent dependency on the elevator. That's what I'm saying. There's no ramp, so I, I would be thinking if we would have something like this, I would include a ramp, so that you are not exclusively dependent on the elevator. So if there's a mechanical failure in the yeah. elevator, you still have access. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can revisit that location. Yeah. That's the beauty of new. Yeah, <laughs> we can you can do, do it. We can do anything we want. Uh, yeah, that, that was one thing that I would say uh, include a ramp just for the future changes. Another thing is, as they were saying, the demographics change, and we've seen it in the business right now that sometimes you have a cohort where you have four classrooms. Uh, and I, I was also looking how can you accommodate that within here. There's not much of a flexibility. There's no one more room that you could maybe swing uh, if you have, suddenly you have four classrooms in the year. Well, that's one of the reasons we try to arrange the classrooms sequentially. Okay. So that that bubble in the population just moves, moves along that, that linear arrangement. But it would be... The assumption is it's a bubble, not growth. Right. So, so if something goes yeah, growth, you have to go the growth, growth right. and you have an efficiency because if you have 21, Right. If you yeah, have yeah, four, yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. come to one I mean, another. The, the point is if it's up someplace, maybe down somewhere Correct. else. Right. If it's not, and it's actually just straight growth, then, then you, you have, have a problem. problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have expansion as part of the yeah. strategy. Okay. So, given our time, um, I would like... Discipline, Mr. Chair. Yes, Discipline. <laughs> I would like to move us on. Um, but I want to make sure you feel like we've given you a sense of direction for our next meeting. Um, I know we've got some stuff we were not able to answer tonight. Um, we've commented on these a little bit, but what, what more would you be looking for us before we kind of... And anything that? that comes to mind after okay. this meeting should be brought back to yes. us for you, the chair. Okay. 
uh, so that we can try to, uh, as soon as we can, start incorporating that into revisions of this. Okay. So by no means done, we're going to go through another round of revisions. So the sooner we get that feedback, the better. Okay. We may move on. And, well, the, the, the next topic has the potential for <laughs> being something we could talk about for a long time. I think I'm. I guess what I almost want to do is is kind of leave it for the next time because I, I'd like to give it a good, good full airing, and that the that next topic is, is public outreach, um, and we'd actually asked TSKB for a little bit of feedback on how they would want to do that, um, but I think we could easily talk about that for a half an hour, and so if no one has an objection, I'm going to say let's set this aside, turn it to the agenda. Can I only mention? Um, on the public page about press releases. I don't think if any of you have seen much traction of the press releases that we have seen it. I haven't seen it no. in any of the, in my PGO, in the, anywhere. So um, I would like to see it more out. I don't know if there's a way that we can each contact our own PGO and maybe send it, ask why it's not out so that there's more outreach. I know that you sent the issue about the preschools, but I don't know if it went out. Yeah, so I was going to try and get in touch with Diane about that. I think she might have access to, to apparently there exists in, in Amherst a yes. principal, preschool principals listserv. And I'm hoping somebody knows how to access that and is willing to let us post to that. So we're going to try to make use of that, and I think Diane's our um, go-to on that. Um, and the other place we had hoped to distribute press releases is through our own um, listserv sign up, and I don't think we've done that yet either. They're posted so on the web. They are posted on the web. We had advertised that we would send the press releases directly to the emails as well. If, we're, if we don't want to do that, we could decide we don't want to do that, but it is something we said we. Yeah, I think Again, as I said, I will send anything to the list, but just tell me what to send. Okay, we need to well, send the press release. Send the press send release. Send the press. <laughs> okay. Why not? Uh, right. Yeah. Just Yeah, I thought I'd send an email or uh, to uh, send press I don't release. Know, can you help us through from the school Do you committee side? Can you help us disseminate this more? Sure. Sure. I need to get back on the agenda. For some reason. Uh, this committee was a regular update of the Amherst School Committee agendas, and I noticed it hasn't been recently. Well, Mike uh, hasn't been here. No, 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 no. I'm saying at the school committee meetings, we, we had a regular standing item where we talked about things that were going on on this committee and updating people, and for some reason it's no longer a standing item. I mean, it's an oversight, but I've got to get it back on the agenda. It would and also, then that would help, basically. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was also, I mean, uh, you know, columns and letters that are written right. by the school committee. I mean, you, it would be nice to get a shout out on those, even if it's you know, even if they're talking about something else, to say, and the Fort River School Building Committee is making progress. Please tune in. Yeah, it might be better to do it more than that. The, oh yeah, and I was saying it. Yeah. <laughs> if not, then we have to go and we'll make a public comment on the next school committee meetings, and one of us go and say we want to hijack a conversation, but. I, no, I if it's not in the agenda, I actually, we have I actually to put it in the agenda. I actually don't agree. I think every single school committee meeting, there should be a standing item where right. I or the superintendent or, or somebody comes, you want right. to come, we actually update the committee and then the public through it on what right. we're doing. And, and at every yeah. single meeting we should do that. At some point. And it's supposed to be a standing item. And I mean, it's an oversight. Yeah. It just got dropped for some reason. I got to turn this back on. And at some point, I don't know if this is the right terminology, we, we almost should have some sort of joint Meeting. Absolutely. And where the exact appropriate time is, I'm not going to claim to quite know at this point, but as we're getting closer to the end, we have more of a finished product. I think, you know, we're going to do pub general public outreach, but I think it'd be great to... I, I think the question, I, the question I'd have um, for, for the committee, but also for you, would be, is that before or after the December holidays? Because I think it'd be either, I think it'd be my, my thought in my head based on where we are right now is it either would be before it, before them or after them, yeah. would be a good time. Because I also don't want to have a discussion with the school committee about where we're at 
at the point everything's so baked and so done right. that right. we're not really asking for feedback. We're just saying here's the finished, here's the almost finished product. What do you think of it? You're right. We need to have a progress report, progress meeting, yeah. and yeah. look for feedback. So when do you think that would be? Early December? Yeah, before before the holidays. Yeah, because yeah, we we'll have our estimates back by then. Yeah. And we we're planning to do a, a general public outreach the weekend, the week after Thanksgiving. Right. And so it so, would be appropriate to be in that time. So let me, let me also talk to the chair of the Amherst School Committee and try to get some, you know, a large chunk of an agenda set up for that time period. Okay. And we'll let you know what the dates are. Great. Would it make sense to do it before the public outreach forum or after? Uh, before. Before. Yeah. It has to be, I think we would have to go to yeah, school. Yeah, it's almost before. kind of a courtesy yes. thing. Yes. yes. So yes. since we are scheduling the thing for after Thanksgiving, we should have to schedule with the school committee before Thanksgiving. Before, which well, is not that far away. <laughs> so that, that means uh, that we have a meeting on November 5th, I right know. Yeah. And then I think the next one after that is two weeks later, I want to say. Can you book us? Yeah. So, yeah, two, so it'd be November 6th. 13th, 20th, probably the November 20th. Okay. That, that sounds fine. The that is, which is also why it somehow seems unlikely. That we <laughs> really? I mean, it's not on Thanksgiving itself. But I mean, yeah. it's, it's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. The, the school committee meetings are open to the public anyway. They are yeah. indeed. Yeah. So that will be the first time that the public will be because when the broadcast is here. It will be the first time the public can attend, and will they be allowed to comment? Uh, it all depends on how we structure the meeting. I'm not trying to sound cute. Uh, it, we can do that at meetings. We don't always. I, I know that sounds vague. I, the I school committee will want to talk about it. Is, is it? Yeah, I mean, it, it also depends on the purpose of having. So the Amherst School Committee meeting is, is November 27th. We're meeting November, uh, November 5th and I think November 27th. Okay, so that's after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah, because that was one of the dates we were thinking of for our... So November 27th would be a good date for our meeting with the school committee. Well, but except I think we were already thinking one of the, that might, might have actually been the day we were thinking we would do the public outreach. Public outreach um, because that's... You're on a date of our school committee meeting? No one's going to come to our well, school committee meeting. Hey, if we weren't interesting. Can we do it on November 5th? Yeah, we Yeah. Can we do it? chance we could do it on the 5th? No. Because, okay. We're it's doing the full. dual language immersion uh, school vote that day. That meeting is going to be back. Well, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I mean, no, I, I could talk to the chair, but yeah. I just I no, think it, that's completely that, realistic. Yeah. Can, can, well, may we uh, invite other school, the school committee to our meeting on the 21st? Oh, well, that's another. We have a meeting on the 21st? No, well, we do. Yeah, okay. if we're on every other Wednesday schedule. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought we, I thought we had like some sort of like minor strike about having our meeting the day before Thanksgiving. Oh, that's the day before Thanksgiving. Oh. Well, I think you were part of this. I was part of it. Tell, tell me why meeting with the school committee on the 27th is problematic. I don't know. Yeah, they're the ones well, the, the only reason it would be problematic is that we were tr we were trying to find a time to meet with, to be able to be available to the general public um, in that, that small slot of time between Thanksgiving and the holidays. Um, and that was the kind of the first week. And, we could slip to the, the next week, but then that would be the absolute end of it, our opportunities, I think. But but maybe that's what we do. But maybe but we yeah, want to do it. It would be better for us. What do you think? Twenty seventh to meet with the school committee. Okay. okay. Yeah, and and give you enough time. And then follow with public outreach. Yeah. The week okay. after would be. Okay. Okay. Do. Okay. Done. It's okay. I'm just gotta make sure I can get on that. I'll do that. I'll do that tomorrow. Make sure we can get on that calendar. Kind of Call tomorrow. I will say I will send you an email reminder tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, texting. I, okay. I have one more thing. I'm sorry to yep. delay. We were huddling here when we were talking um, earlier about uh, energy or energy meeting sustainability discussion with this committee, and I think we want to do that at the next committee. Meeting. Yes, yes. I agree with that. Great. Okay. okay. And that will be a workshop with you, and we're going to try to get our consultants here as well. Okay. Super. Uh, back to what's left on my calendar here, my agenda here. Um, there was an email from Jim that came through rather quickly that I didn't get to fully absorb. Um, but I believe we have 
it sounded, looked like there was, the solicitation was ready. Um, but I don't know that we were prepared to, oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, Jim did prepare the geotech yeah. specs. In fact, the mysterious papers you found okay. had been left by him, uh, elf-like, for us to find. <laughs> but none of us realized that they were. Um, so those specs look pretty ready to me. Okay. I, have, I need to figure out who I'm going to send them to. Okay. Uh, I'll Jim. Yeah, um, but I, they, they look solid to me. I'll okay. change some formatting, but they, I, if everyone else is fine, I'll still send them out as soon as possible. I didn't have any. Yeah. And that solves that mystery, too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you should change the gun. And we, yeah. and we don't have the survey report yet. But no, but it's, I think it's, okay. it's, it's working its way. Okay. We have a question okay. about that. like. This, oh, the soil boring test that, that the solicitation is going out to, that's the one you were talking about. So that that will show water table? Yes. 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 And it will show the nature of the soil as well. Right. So um, that's when we'll start to get to know what kind of strategies for foundation. foundations and sort of Waterproof. waterproofing and yeah. Water we have to avoid water. Whether we're building a boat or we're building a... <laughs> That's another way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> a boat or getting rid of the water somehow. Or, or potentially piles. Yeah. Or, yeah. Whether we're building an island or a boat or... Yeah, something else. Um, I have a quick update on committee membership. I had a back and forth with the town manager who said that because you didn't get sworn in ben. before the vote, that was it. the whole process had to be completed according to the rules that have been handed down. Um, I don't like this answer, but it means you have to wait till November, December, whenever they see the, they see the, council. They see the council. But I would greatly, I'm glad you're here tonight. I really want you here. This is this is an important time to have your input, regardless of the fact that you can't vote. Yeah, you're the only person who's in the school. Yes. Day. <laughs> right, right. So I mean, sometimes Diane is able to come. Sometimes Mike Mike is able to come, but it's. It, that we don't go off on a tangent. And so I think we just need to clarify publicly yes. that we are not being allowed to seat a voting member to the committee even though we did everything correct to get him seated and we are being told by the town manager or the select board no. A uh, town manager, uh, you know, uh, kind of in his role was the, yeah. the gatekeeper to the select board, um, that the whole process needed to be I am not happy with that result, but it is an answer that I haven't given. It would be awesome if you kept coming anyway. So yes. Because your, your input is, yeah. to be honest with you, unless we have a big argument amongst the committee, yeah. your input's more important than your vote. Like, we're doing everything yeah. by consensus, right. 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 then you can shape the consensus. Absolutely. Um, we don't have any invoices to vote on this evening. Um, so Briefly. Are oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, back to item two. Back to item two. <laughs> Meeting minute recorder. I'm sorry. Hello. Hey, That's I'm okay. Park. <laughs> <laughs> it can be difficult to park in town. Um, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to give you kind of an opportunity to say hello. Oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Well, this is Laura Bishop. She's, uh, she's excellent. Uh, by all accounts. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> and with that, if you I'll need like anything from us, by the way, like enunciate more clearly, speak up, do whatever. <laughs> We're very good at mumbling at times, I guarantee you. <laughs> 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 yes. With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> oh, we got it.